Hello and welcome to Lady Dynamite Creates. Today I'm going to be showing you how I made my Warrior Fairy. The base doll I'm going to be using on this project is a Luna Matthews. And originally I had a hard time choosing between her and Gigi Grant. And actually up until I finalized her clothing, had not decided which one I was going to use. But when I saw all of the nice areas of sculpting were going to be covered on the Gigi Grant doll, I decided this one should be the one. I go ahead and buzz her hair down like normal and then I pop her into a cup of hot water to sit for a few minutes. This just gets the vinyl nice and soft and allows me to pull off the head easily. I'm using a cloth to help protect my hands this way the hot water doesn't burn me. And if you notice when I'm pulling the head off, I'm pulling it straight and not at an angle. Any of the times I've actually chipped the neck or broken out the neck peg has been when I have angled the doll. So I tried to avoid doing that. Using a flathead screwdriver, I scrape out all the hair plugs and loosen up that glue. Then using my needle nose pliers, I pull it out through the neck hole. It was so nice to prep a doll that just didn't have nasty sticky hair for a change. Using 100% acetone, I wipe off all of the factory paint. I prep her scalp for rerouting with some acrylic paint. This is just a color that is very similar to the hair color I've picked. I do a few coats to make sure it's opaque enough. I have plans to shave signs and want to make sure none of that yellow is showing through. For the reroute, I am using this Arctic Blue from the Doll Planet, and I actually picked the hair color after I'd made all of the clothing. I had quite a few fabrics lined out to make the outfit with, and I wanted to finalize that before I picked a color. The reroute on her was pretty simple since she didn't have a part line. She's going to be styled in a mohawk down the center of her head. So I rooted around the hairline and then just filled that in, and then a couple of spaces around the temple are going to be decorative braiding. I use the knotting method to reroute, and I wrap the hair around my finger, slide the needle on, tighten it, and then plug it down into the head. Then to secure all the hair, I use a little bit of liquid fusion glue, squeeze it down into the head, and jam it around with a q-tip, and make sure I coat all of those plugs, including the ones that are at the temples away from the main hunk of hair. For the outfit, I went ahead and did some rough sketches just to get a silhouette of what I was looking for, and I did several just to see what I liked. I wanted a look with a lot of leathers and furs. Think along the lines of old school Hollywood, like Conan the Barbarian or One Million Years BC with Raquel Welch. Then once I decided on a design, I went ahead and started making my patterns. I wrapped my mannequin up with some kitchen clean film and some masking tape, and then just started sketching out the design for the shirt. The things that I kept in mind when designing this was any decorative themes that I wanted to have, which natural themes would the bodice have, and also since she was a fairy and would have wings, I needed to keep that in mind too. Once I was satisfied with that, I went ahead and cut it out and made paper patterns from that duct tape form. When making my paper patterns, I need to remember to add enough for seam allowance on all of my pieces, as well as places for closures on the back piece. These will be closed with some Velcro, so I add a little bit of extra fabric on the back just to account for that space. One thing I noticed when trying to cut out my pattern pieces was this fabric was extra slippery and I was quickly getting shapes that were not the actual shapes I was traced. To solve this problem, I used a little bit of Kids Craft glue sticks and glued my pattern pieces down directly to the fabric and cut out around those. This solved my problem and all of my pattern pieces came out fine after that. I attached the two center front pieces to their side pieces. Next, I sew the two center seams on the top and the bottom. I apply fray check to all of these seams and flatten them out with my fingers and then hit them with my flat iron. This will reduce the appearance of lumps and bumps in the garment. Now I attach the top and bottom portions of the shirt. Next I measure out where the straps should meet on the back and tack those down and apply some Velcro as a closure. With an orangey brown embroidery thread, I do a decorative cross stitch down the front of the garment just to give it a little bit more detail. Now for her first doll. I found this particular fur that had a lot of nice patterning to it and it was pretty short so it worked well on doll scale. So I cut out an oval of this and I folded this in half right sides facing and pinned up the edges of it and sewed those down. This leaves an opening in the middle for me to flip it. Once sewn, I trim up all of the excess off the edges and flip it right side out.
Once it's right side out, I go ahead and stitch up that hole using a ladder stitch. And I'll have to say this was a pretty messy stitch job, if I do say so, but if you've ever tried to stitch fur, you can't see crap because of all the fur. I try this onto my mannequin and I see where I want this to fit. Once I'm satisfied with the placement, I go ahead and sew on some snaps. Sew on one onto one shoulder and one onto the bust side in the middle of the stole. I sew the corresponding snaps onto the shirt. At this point, I go ahead and stitch on one side of the chain too. There's going to be a chain that connects from the shoulder to the breast side and the top point will be sewn on and there will be a hook at the other side. If you've ever worked with fur, you know what a nightmare it is. Just kept getting my thread trapped and just couldn't see what I was doing. And that's not even counting all of the fur that was on everything in the house. And here you can see how all these attachments work. For her shoes, I'm going to make these pull-on moccasin style boots, and this is not stretch pleather. If you see, when I'm pulling along the grains, it does not stretch at all. So in order to use this on something that does need to have a little bit of give, I'm going to be sewing it along the bias. I'm going to twist this to be on the diagonal. You can see when I'm stretching this at the bias on that diagonal, there is a decent amount of stretch to it. I want my boots to have a decorative stitch down the front. To accomplish this, I'm going to cut this piece down that diagonal line and then re-sew it along that line. After the pieces are sewn together, I go ahead and trim off the excess on either end, and then I'm gonna use a little bit of uh, fabric fusion, and I'm going to flatten out those two seams so that there's not that extra added bulk and I can get a good tight fit on her leg. I use my flat iron to help activate and set the glue. You'll notice I'm not using anything in between my flat iron and this. My flat iron is such a low setting that it's not gonna damage my pleather. Now that that seam is flattened, I'm going to do a zigzag stitch across of it just to give it some visual interest. Now that my decorative stitch is added, I'm going to go ahead and sketch out the pattern for the boot. I trim some of the excess off and then I'm going to sew down that edge, leaving the top and the bottom of the shoe open. Once sewn, I flip it right side out. I try it onto a mannequin and then I go ahead and start trimming up along the edge of the foot. I'm going to leave about two millimeters along that seam. That's just going to allow me space to sew on the sole. I cut my sole out of a piece of real leather. I want this to be pretty sturdy and not fall apart and I worried that some pleather would start fraying and just rip. Once I have my sole cut out, I start stitching it in place. It's a little unwieldy at first, but once you get the first half of it sewn on, it becomes much easier. When you're first getting the stitches started, you're trying to hold the sole on, hold the boot in place, and it's a little difficult at first, but it does get easier. I'm just using a basic whip stitch just all around the edge. Once I've sewn it all the way around and I'm back at my starting point, I can tie off the thread. For the decorative fur trim, I have just cut a strip of that same fur fabric again and I am wrapping it around and hot gluing it in place. Once I've made it all the way around, I'm going to trim that up and I slide my scissors along the base of the fur so that I'm not cutting the longer pieces of fur into a blunt cut. This leaves the fur having its knife's taper still. Now I'm adding in some wrapping to the boots and I've just taken these little thin strips of jewelry leather and I've just wrapped them around and tacking them in place with a little bit of hot glue. To finish off the top of the boot and to help hide that odd fur edge, I'm using a little bit of the jewelry leather. This is just a little bit thicker piece and I'm wrapping around and gluing it at the top. I'm actually really happy with how these boots came out. Now for her weapons. I knew I wasn't going to have time to actually model anything for this doll because I had a feeling these wings were going to be very time consuming, which they were. So I went on to Thingiverse and found these and just it's a standard axe and some little medallions and daggers. I'll have the link for these in the description box below, but I'm just getting them sanded and ready for painting. But before I can start painting, I want to make a holster. 
I use the axe itself to make a template and then just sketch out a basic shape for a very simple axe holster. I've cut out these pieces out of faux leather and then I'm going to put them wrong sides facing and do a blanket stitch around the very corner of the top and the front edge and up to the bottom to where the handle's going to be sticking out. I add a strip of that jewelry leather all the way around it, making sure that I leave enough room that it can hang from a belt. After it's together, I mark where the belt will be going through and I tack that down. I also add a hook and eye, this way the axe can actually come in and out of the holster. Using a little bit of super glue, I start tacking down some nail art gems. These are just going to give some visual interest and make it not quite so plain and give it some real world feel. To add a closure to the belt, I'm adding a piece of chain to one side, just super gluing that into place, and then sewing down a hook to the other side, and this allows the belt to come on and off very easily. Then using these exact same techniques, I made a thigh holster for one of the daggers too. Now that I don't have to worry about damaging a paint job, I can start painting these weapons. And I've already got them based out in a black coat of paint. I'm masking off any areas that are going to be silver or gold and then gonna give those a shot of spray paint. Now that my axe has a silver blade, I'm going to paint the handle to look like wood. And it does take a few coats to work up to a deep enough color. All the little medallions are gold, so I'm going to start giving them a dry brushing of black to start deepening some in those areas, and I just liberally apply it and then wipe away any excess. I also weather the dagger and the axe in this technique. For the final touches on her dagger and her axe, I'm going to add leather wrapping to the handles. I just felt like they were lacking something and this just added a little bit of extra. The final touches for her outfit is just adding on all of her little medallions. The smallest one is going to go on her thigh holster, she's going to have one as a belt buckle, and then the final two are going to be the connection points on her stole. I'm not going to show how I made her skirt, it was a very simple build, just strips of fabric glued to a strip. For her wings, I knew I wanted them to have a fuzzy look like moth wings, and I found this silvery gray upholstery fabric that was kind of a velvety feel to it, and I thought it was just beautiful. However, the backside of it was kind of ugly. To solve that problem, I'm going to combine it with the silky gray fabric. To adhere them together, I'm using double-sided interfacing, and I'm just going according to the package directions on those. Now that my fabric's together, I trim off any of the excess, and then I sketch out my veining pattern onto the fabric. 
I take this over to my sewing machine and I set this at a very short stitch length and I just carefully stitch these out, taking time to be careful around the curves and get a nice pretty line. And this is how it looks after it comes off the sewing machine. This is just my line pattern. Now I need to actually add in my patterning for the wings themselves. My inspiration for this came from a magpie moth and they have these gorgeous black and yellow patternings. To add this to my fabric in a cohesive way that it looks a little bit mirrored, not quite twins but sisters, I made a stencil and sketched that out onto my fabric using some fabric markers. Once I have both wing patterns drawn out, I'm going to use a fabric pen and mark where the other wing will be broken. I didn't want to accidentally embroider areas that I didn't have to because this is going to take a while. I add my fabric to the embroidery hook and then using some embroidery floss, I start stitching out my pattern. I'm just using a basic satin stitch to fill in all of this space. I first go in with my black and then I go back in with my yellow. This actually took a little longer than normal embroidery because I had to make sure it looked pretty on both sides, so it was a little bit more time consuming. This felt like it took forever to finish, but with the magic of editing, voila, finished wings. So now that the embroidery is all complete, I'm going to start trimming these down and I just take my scissors and I trim down any of the excess, trying to get as close to that outlining stitch as possible. I'm very careful not to accidentally cut any of the embroidery threads. That would be a nightmare. This fabric was on the thick side, so I am going to take my fabric markers and cover up those edges so that the black and the yellows are matched up to their front and back sides. After six hours, these do need to be heat set. Finally, to attach the wings, I'm going to be dropping just a little bit of hot glue down into that very convenient back hole on Linda Matthews and then putting her magnet down in there. Then for the wing side of things, I'm going to be attaching a magnet with a little bit of hot glue there making sure to hit both of those sides of the wings. And then I'm gonna be encasing that with some fabric just to make sure it doesn't pull off. I just take a piece of fabric that's cut down to shape and hot glue that in place too. Now her wings snap on and off very easily. Now onto the face up. Her face has been prepped with two coats of Mr. Super Clear, allowing about 30 minutes in between each coat to dry before I can start working on her face up. The first thing I always like to start with is sketching in the eye shape. And I always start with my left side first and then match my right to that side. However, this time around, my doll is going to be battle damaged. She is a warrior. She's going to be getting in fights. And so I thought it would be cool to have her have a scar down one side of her face. And it has damaged that eye, blinding it essentially. So it wasn't very important that they matched. I mean, she's a warrior fairy. She's wearing leather. I'm assuming she got in a fight with a squirrel or something. So after I finalized her eye shape and the placement of the scar, I filled in the scleras and then I started blushing out her face. I blushed her out first in a pastel almost the same color as her and then I'm going in with some blues and just pulling in areas here and there. This is just going to give her some variation to her skin tone like natural skin has. Then using some darker ochre colors, I'm going to start detailing around her eyes, her nose, her mouth, and her ears, just any of the areas that are going to naturally have a little bit deeper skin tone. I use a Q-tip to blend some of these areas out when the shadow just appears too harsh. I use a pencil to define the eyelid crease. This doll did push me a little bit out of my comfort zone and I have to say I did procrastinate on some stuff a little bit because it scared me. <laughs> Those wings especially scared me. I was really terrified about how I was going to accomplish that look. I really wanted them to have a fuzzy feel to them like you kind of see with real moths and just didn't know how I was going to accomplish that and went through several iterations.
Using a darker pastel, I darken just the inside of the mouth and then using a brighter coral, add the lip color. I use this coral to blush her cheeks too. Using a larger fluffy brush, I start doing the major contouring to the face. I'm just going right around the sides and in the hollows of the cheek. Using a very bright, vibrant red, I detail some of the larger areas of the scar, and I use this same red to detail the corners of the eye. I use a lighter pink in the middle area of the waterline. I start hitting up some various areas for some white highlights. Using a black watercolor pencil, I start adding some black to that, just defining the edge of the scar. This just adds some depth there. I darken up the lash line. Using some turquoise pastels, I start sketching in the shape for the eyebrows, and once again, since these are scarred, they don't have to match, which made my job a lot easier this time around. And that was the last thing I did on layer one. At the start of layer two, the first thing I do is start sketching in the iris shapes. Take my time getting my shapes right, and once I'm happy with those, I start basing in the colors. One eye I am doing in shades of turquoise, and the other one is going to be in shades of grays and whites because it is a blinded eye. One thing I did want to show you is my pencil left this little clump of pigment on the eye. I don't know if it was the heat or the humidity affecting on that day or what. I gently took the flat edge of my X-Acto, not the sharpened edge, and just scraped, just pulling off a little clump of that pigment. After I fixed that, I just build up the color a little bit more and then add in my pupil. I am just going to let you know that on all these layers, I am applying more pastels to the eyes and around the face. I just don't always show it. It's a little repetitive. I start detailing out the eyebrows, adding just little flicks of hair, and I do this in several different colors of that same turquoise. And I move back to the eye, adding in some striations of color. Using my gray watercolor, I start shading around the scalera of the eye, just giving it a rounder feel shading it towards the top and around the sides. Using a very sharp watercolor pencil, I start adding in my lower lashes. I do find when I'm drawing lashes, the more controlled I try to be, the worse they look. I try to be very loose and just keep them with quick flicks. Using my stubby brush, I start adding in some shading around the scar. This is just pushing it so that it looks like more of a raised edge like you naturally get with scars. I do a few different passes on the lips using a couple of different colors of pencils, just detailing out some of the lip lines. I use a blender pencil to soften up some of those lines so they don't appear so harsh. That's it for layer two, on to layer three. And I start this one off with a little bit of metallic watercolor in the eyes. I use a black watercolor pencil to define the nostrils and then using a very sharp black pencil, start adding in the top lashes.
The fourth and final layer is just about those highlights. So I go in with some white gouache and I hit the tear ducts and waterline as well as the catch lines. And she's all done. I'm very pleased with how she came out. This was the first time I'd ever worked on a scar before and I felt like I did a decent job with it. On to the body. First she needs to be prepped so I start sanding away at her and I have to say it was a fine line between trying to sand her and not sand away her details. I did feel like there was moments I was having trouble getting the pastels to adhere because I couldn't sand in those areas well enough. One thing I did find helpful was sanding with the corner of the sanding block because it allowed me to angle into some of the tighter areas. After I've got her sanded is about as good as she's going to get. I get her all wiped down and let her dry off and then give her several coats of Mr. Super Clear. Then I get started blushing her body. Her molding is just so absolutely beautiful that she is just a dream to blush. There's just so many little nooks and crannies and things to highlight on her body that it just takes forever because you can just keep finding areas. I use the same pastels that I used on her face on her body and I use those corals to bring out the blushing areas like the tops of her breast and her hips and any of the joints and then I use those golden ochres and some of the darker browns to go into the nooks and crannies and any area that just needed an extra pop. I felt like some of the deeper areas just weren't getting highlighted enough, so I did go in with a pencil and would rub it along just the edge, making tiny little lines, and would go in with a Q-tip or the blending pencil to blend them out a little softer. Yes, I do know that a lot of these areas that I'm blushing will not be seen at all because like they're covered with their boots or whatever, but it felt like a shame to not highlight them too, and just in case her clothes are ever off. Then when I'm finally satisfied with the blushing, I go ahead and give her a couple of coats of Mr. Super Clear and her body's all done. Now we're going to jump over to the hairstyling. And like I said, I wanted her to have the shaved sides. We only rerouted down the very middle of her hair. So we're going to need to make flocking. And I have this yarn that is a very close match to what her hair is. So I'm going to pull out some strings of it. And I'm just going to start clipping this down into this little cup. And I'm just clipping it and clipping it, clipping and clipping very small little snips at a time until all of that's done. Then I'm going to start clipping and clipping and clipping into the cup as well until I get a nice fine powder. To apply the flocking, I'm using some Mod Podge and a silicone tool and I'm applying this very thickly and I'm trying to do this very fast because I want to apply this whole section in one go and have to work quick so that it doesn't dry on me. So apply it thick, pop down some flocking and let it sit. Don't move it. Once you've allowed the glue to dry, you can start getting off all the excess. Then I just take and dump off as much as I can and slowly just brush it off with my fingers. At a certain point, I've gotten all that I can get off that way and I take a toothbrush and I gently just brush the hair. This pulls off any that's not adhered well and any excess that's just going to sit there. You don't want this eventually just being everywhere on the doll. If you have some bald spots, it's fine. Just apply a little bit more glue in those areas, pat down some more flocking, allow it to dry, and repeat this step. I decided to style her hair into a fishbone French braid and to do this I take a section of the front of her hair and I divide it in two. Then I take a piece from the right side and put it into the left hand with that section and a piece from the left side and put it into the right hand into that section. And then I just keep doing this until I get all the way down to the base of the neck. Once I've reached the base of the neck, I'm just going to put it into a ponytail holder. Now for all of those little pieces at the temples. I'm just going to take those, divide them, and do basic braids with them. So there'll be four braids, two on each side. When I get down to the bottom of the braid, I tie it off with a piece of string, 
I clip off any of the excess and then I melt the ends with a lighter. Then styling them is pretty simple. I just take them and I cross them over into an X and then wrap them around underneath the ponytail and wrap them around the ponytail and then glue them in place. So the idea for this doll actually came from a subscriber, Petra Puckner. Very sorry if I mispronounced your name. She commented a while back and she said that she thought it'd be really cool if I made a warrior fairy that had a ripped up wing. And I did. I thought that was a really great idea. So it got jotted down in my little idea book. And I really love hearing all of your ideas. And I can't always promise that they will be something that I can make, but I do love hearing from you guys. For the ones that are closer to the ears, I take those and I twist them twice over the head so they are more at the crown. Then I wrap them underneath the ponytail and bring them back up to that crown area and then I pin them in place. I then tuck those ends back into the braid so that they are a little bit hidden. The final thing I do on the hair is do a little bit of curling. I know this hair says that you're not supposed to use human styling tools, but I think mine have such a low temperature on them that it doesn't hurt it, hasn't melted it yet. So I gently curl the hair, then I clip it up with a clip and let it sit like that for a while so it holds the curl a little longer. I don't want this ponytail to be super curly, I just want it to have a slight curl at the bottom. Now it's time to attach your head back to our body. And I just take and pull those two prongs back so that they are kind of tucked in and then just gently twist her head on. The final detail I wanted to add to her body was a little bit of fur at the top of the wings. I'm taking a little bit of brushed yarn that I've cut down to this tapered edge and I'm just hot gluing that right above where the magnet sits. So when it's time for the wings to plop on, it'll have the nice flow with the wings. Now it's time to get her dressed. At the time this video goes live, this doll will be available in my Etsy store at Lady Dynamite Creates. The link is down in the description box. Thank you so much for watching, and if you liked this video, please give it a thumbs up and subscribe to the channel. I try to put out videos every two to four weeks, just depending on how hectic my life gets. Stay tuned for the final reveal photos at the end. Remember, always be creating!